your um, Sergeant Devine, I'm going to be your instructor today. Um, who's, the, who's the oldest person in your class? They, no, I meant for who's attending. Who's attending? Who's, uh, who's 16? Who's 17? 17. Anybody 18? 118. Okay, so you'd be the oldest, I guess. Unless we got a 19, 20, 21, 22. Alright, the reason why I was just asking is because I'm sure none of you have really attended college yet, right? well, high school, and that's fine. If, you're, if you haven't attended a class like you're about to, it's most, this is going to be based on discussion. Please do not let me be the one talking the whole time, okay? And what I mean by that is I don't mean to have conversations with yourselves or, hey, let's just chat away. It's going to be a structured discussion. When I, when I say anybody, anybody, that really means somebody say something. Because if I talk, we're going to be here for it. It's going to be very long, very boring. And you guys deal with that while you're in school all day. You don't need to come here and have that exact same thing, right? Cool? All right. Awesome. Well, as you can see, it says Operation Rolling Thunder. Now, just, just so you know, you guys are already going to have a lot of lessons on different air operations on that the book that you guys are going with. This is going to be a little bit outside your curriculum. Okay? That's why it's going to be like this. I urge you to pay attention because there is going to be a lot of underlying themes and I'm going to give you them as we go through. The underlying themes are important because it's how us in the military, and you guys aren't in the military, but us in the military learn lessons. It's very important and I'll explain why as we go through. All right, summary, theme, already covered it. Historical battles, we're going to go over a couple of very old ground battles. Obviously, airplanes were only invented in you know, the 19th, 20th century. So let's not, but we're going to do, go through some of the start of aviation. World War I, two, Korea, Ow. Vietnam. After Vietnam, post Vietnam, and then we'll conclude. All right, starting with lessons learned. Has anybody ever heard this quote before? Those who do not know history are doomed to repeat it. Yes, yes, yes. All right, cool. Does anybody really understand why that's important? Right. You want to, somebody want to care to be the brave one and help me? Go ahead. Uh, it means that if you do not decide from your past and do not learn the mistakes made and you do not know what went wrong, you're bound to make the same mistakes that were made. Very good. Very good. Now, does it always have to be a personal history or can it be personal? Any history. history any history. Anything that right? happened before current time. Mm -hmm. yep. Another one. Adapt to an enemy's tactics as he will adapt to yours. Has anybody ever heard that before? Does anybody know who actually said it? No, you don't, because that's why it's anonymous. Just for this, it's very important. We learn these lessons all the time in World War I, World War II, so on, even until present day. The more you fight with the same enemy, regardless whether you're doing air combat, ground tactics, it doesn't matter. They're going to learn your tactics especially if you're doing the exact same thing over and over and over again. That's why we as a military have learned to adapt to what's called asymmetrical warfare. Asymmetrical warfare is forever changing. We don't know what the battlefield's gonna look like tomorrow, okay? And that's the same for the sky. You don't know what's gonna come at you when you're just flying. You're always asymmetrical. You're never just symmetrical. That, that time has passed. No, I just threw this in here because I really admire this man. Anybody ever heard this before? Wars are fought with weapons, but they are won by men. Anybody? Yeah. Heard that before I just said it. He's a personal hero of mine, General Patton. He was a general during the World War II. Right? None of you ever served there, right? I'm just, I'm, I'm really just trying to get you guys to 
wake up a little bit. All right. The reason why I put that in there is because you want to fly, correct? That's what this is about. That's why you're here, right? You all want to get into an airplane and fly. It's all well and good, right? Do, do you think the uh, planes that we fly in the military, do you think they win the war? Do you think they get the cargo there? Who does? You do, right? Pilots do. People do. We get it there. Without us, it doesn't work. That goes anything from turning a wrench all the way up to sitting in the cockpit. It's a team effort. And that's why it's important that you understand that, whether it is now all the way up until when you're actually in that cockpit. All right, some historical battles. Battle of Mafia. Anybody know what that was? It was a battle of um, the Greeks and the uh, Persians. Very good. Very good. Does anybody know what the Hollywood movie they make? Uh, yeah, there we go. But I'm glad, I'm glad that you actually knew it from just Battle of the Mafia. All right. Greece versus Troy. Everybody seen the movie Troy, I'm sure, right? Everybody's heard of the Trojan horse and all this stuff? Okay. Well, let's start with the Battle of Thermopylae. Crude drawing, I know. You can't get an actual drawing of the battlefield because, well, it didn't exist. But this is what it looked like, in a sense. You had your coastline, and they basically thought they could funnel the Persians into a bottleneck and win, correct? That essentially how they uh, how we understood it. Anybody have something to add to that? All oh, right, pretty cut and dry. Spartans had one fatal flaw. Does anybody know what that is? Okay. There's only three hundred of them, and there was a mountain pass that went around. Regardless of the mountain pass, there was something that they were going to fail before they actually got before they got surrounded. Anybody else know why? Their tactics. They never change. They never ever change their tactics. Later on, after the Battle of Thermopylae, Spartan actually rose up, pushed the Persians out of Greece, and then actually started conquering Greece to unite them in city states. Problem was, is the Spartan used the flanks for the hoplites. Their tactics never changed. They never adapted to the bow and arrow. They never changed. Their, their methods. What happens when you fight the same enemy over and over and over again using the exact same methods? They learn where your weakness is. Everything has a weakness. And that was the ultimate downfall for the Spartans. At the Battle of Thermopylae, they would have eventually fallen. It was just because they were using, they were playing right into the Greeks' hands, for the Spartans' hands for the longest time. They just kept throwing themselves right at the front of them. Kept throwing, kept throwing, kept throwing. And eventually, he would have broken through, probably, but the mountain pass, yes, outflanked them. Also, the fact that they don't retreat. Yeah. They could have retreated and took it up a different position, but. Okay. Greece versus Troy, or uh, everybody knows that the battle where the Trojan horse was used was won in Troy, correct? Everybody's seen that? All right. The wall in which the Trojans said would never been breached, right? The Greeks attacked days. I mean, there's no real account of it. You can read the books, and there's always a different discrepancy on how long the battle lasted. Without getting too technical, we know that the Greeks attacked, it, uh, attacked from the shoreline and moved onward. Boy, that's just not coming up. There it goes. Crap, attacked from the shoreline and kept hitting up against the against the arrows and basically when the Trojans lined up in front of the walls. Right? Do they have anything they want to add to that? Everybody's got that. What caused them to beat the Trojans? Everybody knows this guy. The Trojan horse. The Trojan horse. And why did that? Why was that such a game changer? There was no one's ever done that before, and it was a whole new strategy, and I never saw it coming. Exactly. New strategy. 
Remember my whole underlying theme to, theme to this whole thing is how do we learn our lessons from past battles, right? We learn how to adapt to different situations. We don't just do the exact same thing over and over and over again. Although it's been tried, but every chance is a failure. You'll see as we get further and further and further along, okay? The reason why I bring up those ancient battles, I mean, I could have picked a whole bunch, but those are just the best known, obviously. I've had at least enough participation. All right, aviation. That is definitely not what I wanted it to do. Aviation was broken down into two categories. Can anybody tell me what they were or are? Uh, heavier than air and lighter than air. Awesome. Which was what was lighter than air? Lighter than air will either use the heat to lift. Uh, a balloon or a helium or a gas that's essentially lighter Perfect. than air. Heavier than air. Okay. It's Go. using the uh, fluid dynamics of a wing shape to fry the lift to an aircraft. And then set it better myself. Awesome. Obviously, I've given you the examples that weren't supposed to come up that quickly. Um, for hot air balloons, okay? Believe it or not, there is a predecessor to the hot air balloon, and somebody other than that gentleman back there, somebody else, does anybody know what was a predecessor to a hot air balloon? Chinese kites. Wow, you guys are on fire. Very good. Can you, can you uh, explain what they were used for? They were used to survey the battlefield and see the enemy coming from further away than you could on land. Perfect. Perfect. Wow. You guys are really on point. Just as he said, Chinese kites. Then we have hot air balloons. All right. Does anybody know what its uses were? Military, obviously. I know you guys are Civil Air Patrol, Sea Cadets, and stuff like that. Just know that everything I'm asking you is based off of military history. Okay. So just if you want to go civilian, that's that's fine. But just keep it there so that that's what I'm going. With. Go ahead. Uh, and the Civil War. They very good, very good. And did you, in uh, further along, what does anybody know where the last hot air balloon station was stationed at? It's it's for U.S. I'm not gonna I'm not tricking you guys. That wait, you said the recent the 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 last hot air balloon station for military use. Does anybody know? That I'm pretty sure they use some the army use some type of balloon like over Washington? Close. You're on the East Coast. Not there. Very close. New York Harbor. It actually used to, it was the Army Signal Corps. You were very, you, I thought you were going to say it, so awesome. Kudos to you. The, the uh, hot air balloon, there was only one, and they used it to patrol New York Harbor. And that was basically a lot of generals and a lot of people wanted money for troops, for vehicles, for tanks, for guns. And think about air superiority. That wasn't thought of, especially in the birth of aviation. That was just like, a, all right, cool, you got a higher balloon. Go ahead, go up and take some surveillance for Nobody really put any stock into getting off the ground and how that's going to change warfare. Zeppelins. Anybody know anything about Zeppelins that they would like to share? Any tidbit across the spectrum. Fair one they use in the bombing range across Britain. Awesome. Anybody else? Go ahead. Uh, actually, let him go. I'm sorry. Right. Go ahead. They were actually had a predecessor between them and hot air balloons, which were dirigibles. We say that again? Dirigibles were a predecessor between hot air balloons and zeppelins, which was basically a football-shaped hot air balloon. Yes, that's really good. That was a very cool. Go ahead, what were you going to say? Well, uh, if you ever look at the Empire State Building, there's hooks on the top, and those were originally supposed to be used to hook up dirigibles and zeppelins to yep. the building. Very good. They were supposed to be the new sky ship, carrying people, getting people off the ground, eliminating traffic. 
the, the military use, however, came to a screeching halt because of what incident? Does anybody remember why? Hindenburg. Hindenburg. Where did the Hindenburg go down? New okay. Jersey, I believe. New Jersey. Does anybody know where it took off from? Go ahead. Germany? Nope. <laughs> I mean, it did, but I meant before the, the last stop it made before it crashed. Anybody else? I'm surprised you see cadets don't know. Lyndhurst, Naval Air Station. They actually were there for their, was fueling and getting ready to take off again. I just thought you guys would got that one. That's all right. Um, yes. And with that, it came to a screeching halt. Does anybody know why it came to a screeching halt? Because it was filled with flammable gases and that one lightning hit it. Just Burned What was the gas? Do you know? Helium. Nope. Hydrogen. Hydrogen. It was supposed to be filled with helium. They switched it out to hydrogen, and that's what caused the explosion. It was just a tidbit. Just pretty interesting, though, right? We go with hot air balloons, we have Zeppelins. We, we heard what their military uses were, right? Recon. Hot air balloons, right? bombing runs in World War I for Zeppelins, all right? All right, then we moved into airplanes. Obviously, I'm not gonna sit here and go over, we can go over airplanes all day because they are still in use, just in a different capacity, correct? And rotary aircraft, rotary aircraft, aka helicopters. Awesome, we're just gonna, now we're doing stuff. All right. We talked a little bit about World War One, but we're going to talk about the airplane in World War One. We're not going to talk any more about hot air balloons or that ones. So in World War One, obviously the words are up there when I didn't want them to be. But in World War One, what was the strategy? What was airplanes used for originally? Uh, reconnaissance. Reconnaissance. Why was that? Why do you think? Think it. Uh, I guess they didn't really uh, realize how well planes can perform in that way. Perfect. They didn't know what to do with them. They're brand new, right? Something that nobody has seen before and nobody has used before, correct? Especially in the battlefield. Anybody know who used what used to be the recon strategy? And do not say hot air balloons or zeppelins. Take that out of your mind. It used to be something that we used. It was on the ground. They used to be our cavalry, or just said it. <laughs> cavalry is what we used to use to actually go scout before the infantry got there, so that we knew what the ground was like, how many troops they had, everything. Okay, they were re soon replaced by airplanes in the early stages of World War One because what can airplanes do? You get there faster, right? And they can see more than just sending a whole bunch of cavalry scouts, right? So that was that was important. How did that strategy change? Anybody know? It turned into dogfighting. No, <laughs> actually there's a big gap there, but go ahead. Uh, they started dropping bombs over enemy targets. As too far ahead, them. they're still too far ahead. Go ahead. They started taking pistols up with them, shoot at each other. Bam. That was the next step. And then they said, oh, Look at this. What can we do next? So then Germany decided to mount machine guns on their wing planes. And they actually came up with a mechanism so that it can actually fire without hitting the propeller. It was huge. It was a huge invention. I mean, now we look at it and we think it's so quaint and easy. But to them, to be able to shoot when the propeller was open by the gun and then keep going doing that over and over again, over again while the pilots pull the trigger. That was huge, and it was a huge advantage. Um, sooner the French and, and the US and everybody else followed suit because obviously we had to keep up with it. But that's where dogfighting came into place. And that's where <clears throat> aviation and warfare in the sky as we know it was born. Cool. Anybody like to add something?
moving onward. Now, I have World War II up there. And I have, and we've jumped. Does anybody know what changes came about between World War I and World War II before we got to World War II? What, what changed? Okay. Uh, well, the fighters, well, they're called like pursuit right now. Mm -hmm. So, P. Um, they were used to, they weren't really used for a fighter mission, they were used to like escort the bombs. Okay. Yeah. Do you mean that um, trench warfare started to happen in World War One? Well, yeah, we're, we're out of World War One. How did the airplane, its use in the military evolve from just a straight reconnaissance and dogfighting and escorting bombers, which is what they did in World War One? How did they change? There was a big change because a lot of military generals still weren't completely sold, but enough were that we changed from just single engine air, just the, the propeller uh, by wings plane to faster planes. Why did that all come about? Why did the, the technology and all the research get dumped into airplanes? Does anybody know? There were prizes awarded for people to make faster or higher altitude, et cetera, planes. Yes, but why? Okay. They wanted to save lives, so by upgrading the aircraft, they can destroy supply lines and railroads. And on the right track. The war. You're very, you're, you're right on the track. You're like, nicking the nail. I'm going to give it to you guys. You ready? Because Billy Mitchell, everybody know who that is? Showed that an airplane can actually do a dive bomb on a warship. That changed everybody's mind. I mean, granted, the ship was anchored and staying still. It wasn't firing back. But the fact that he was able to sink a warship with a fighter plane with a bomb attached to it changed everybody's perception. They were like, oh crap, they don't even have to have a Navy. We can't just sit off the coast anymore and just bombard the shoreline without some sort of air cover. That's pretty interesting, right? That was pretty cool in my mind. I was like, wow. That changed everybody's mind. People that weren't sold on the airplane, that didn't think that this was going to happen in the next war, completely changed. Overnight, prizes were awarded for people that can push the limit, the envelope, faster and faster with planes. Bigger planes. Planes that can carry heavier payloads. How we can carry troops, equipment. I mean, everything overnight just changed. They just wanted more and to push the envelope. And that's why World War II was probably the most exciting aviation leap in World War I because we went from just you know, guys on machine guns shooting each other, shooting at each other, and the occasional bomber runs because they weren't really that popular to do. To this, air raids. Okay, and that was huge. Does anybody know the ger the name of the German fighter squad guy? Luftwaffe. Does anybody know where they trained originally? Russia, before they became enemies. They actually got trained in Russia and became Germany's first fighter squadron. And then, of course, grew into the dominating force that they were. And do you know what the Luftwaffe's hugest problem was? The U.S. Once we entered the war, they could not take Britain. They tried. I mean, they bombed that thing into rubble. But they were not able to gain air superiority, dominant air superiority over Britain. Especially after we started supplying Britain and started entering the war with our own jets and our own pilots. Started flying British for the British Air Force. Pretty interesting fact. If you Now everybody knows the date from which the U.S. entered World War II. Okay. Um, I know the year. I don't know the exact date. All right, could give a shot. I think it was uh, 1939. Nope. Okay. 1943. Nope. December 7th, 1941. Nice. What was the what what 
what event December 7, 1941 caused. Everybody's raising their hand now. Jeez. Now they're waking up. I haven't heard from you. Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor. That was the official day that the U.S. entered the war. Does anybody know why the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor? Because uh, we put a tariff on Japan, and they, uh, like, which was like a tax on Japan. No, it, not, not quite. You were close. I believe the United States, and I believe some European countries that were allies, like Britain, Britain embargo on them, and then they couldn't get the raw materials they needed for a war. Right. We put in what was called, President Roosevelt signed into, into bill that we would only supply, we would turn our supplymen from just straight capitalism, basically we were just supplying the world with oil. Yes, at the time, the U.S. was the number one supplier of oil. Gosh, you guys don't even giggle at anything. Yes, that happened. And we went from supplying the world to just supplying our allies. And that, in turn, basically, in the Japan's eyes, basically said, okay, so you pick sides. Because we, they weren't on the list of people we were going to supply. Uh, when, when that occurred, we were outgunned. And the Japanese had a specific fighter that is probably the most significant in everybody's mind. Go ahead. Yes. The Zero fighter? Yes, the Japanese Zero. Do you know what the Japanese Zero fighter um, biggest, I guess you'd say, mechanical flaw it had? Anybody? The huge mechanical flaw that the, the Japanese Zero had. I mean, it was fast. It can carry the right payload. Go ahead. It would run low on fuel first? No, but you were close with the fuel. Go ahead. Uh, maneuverability? Nope. It, I mean, it, it didn't have as much maneuverability as ours, but it did climb faster and had more speed. The fuel tank was metal. We had, a, we had a little secret up our sleeve that didn't get released until later. Does anybody know what our fuel tanks were made of? Rubber. We used a rubber sleeve, kind of like a, a blotter. And it would just, as the fuel would dwindle out of our gas tank, it would actually suck closer and closer together. And then this way, if a round went through it, it wouldn't leak as much fuel, because it would just keep sealing around the leak. And it wouldn't cause a fire. Japanese Zeros had a metal gas tank. So you hit that with a round, what happens when metal scrapes metal? Sparks. Cool. Wait, uh, what about like for fighters today? Fighters today still have a similar method. It's just not made of the same material, but it's the still it's it's still similar. It's a it's a big the tank, especially for cargo planes. I mean, it for cargo planes, but I, I definitely had my I got to fly in a whole bunch of them. They have huge, huge, huge storage capacity in this huge tank, but the tank inside has a very, like a pouch, and it literally stretches and expands to how much fuel is in there. For that simple reason, because when fuel sloshes around, this is another thing that was a flaw, when fuel sloshes around, what do you think happens? It builds up static electricity. When it builds up static electricity, what could happen? Boom, right? Smoke, fire, boom. So that invention, that happened in World War II. Still carries on today. I mean, different materials, but it's still the same concept. Use the bladder to just sucks and opens up. The bombing and air superiority tactic that happened in World War II. I mean, we used it, Japan used it, everybody used it. I mean, they just tried to bomb the enemy into submission, correct? Tackling its railways, trying to hit its supply lines, trying to hit its factories. I mean, all the way up until 1944, we weren't really in Europe. We were in Italy, but we weren't in France or Germany, correct? Okay. Anybody, anybody want to add? All right. 19, it was, does anybody know when we entered into the European theater of war, technically? June 6, 1944. D-Day. Is when we technically hit the 
the European theater. I mean, we were already in Italy, but Italy bottlenecks. It was a fear of every general that we were going to bottleneck at trying to get into Europe. We weren't going to be able to, we were going to get held back. So up until that point, we were all we were doing was we were flying missions out of uh, England and bombing targets in Germany, Poland, and France, wherever they built up supply lines or factories. And the one of the um, there was an actual movie based on one of it. Does anybody know what movie was based on a, a bomber in World War II? Go ahead. You know. Memphis Bell. Memphis Bell. I mean, it's cheesy. Don't get me wrong. I mean, it's Hollywood. It is to be, but there is some truth to it. The Memphis Bell did fly the most missions, and it did. It, it, its crew did was able to, to make it as long as it did. I mean, that was huge because there was very little time for certain positions on the life lifetimes. I mean, they they couldn't keep people in their seats. Uh, the biggest thing is, is that when it came to fuel reserves, I mean, logistics were huge in World War II. We had to have the right amount of fuel, the right amount of ordnance. I mean, we were, I mean, we were accurate. Don't get me wrong, we were accurate with our ordnance. Everybody knows what ordnance is, right? Well, I don't want to insult anybody's intelligence, but if you don't, ordnance is explosives, bombs. Okay, so we were, we were accurate to a point. I mean, for that time, believe it or not, the, the bombardier, when he looked at the device that he used, was considered classified. If, if the, bomb, the plane was ever to crash and there was any crew alive, they had to actually destroy that piece of equipment because they felt it was so high tech based on the German uh, sweep bombs. It's just a bomb, propaganda, however you want to think about it. The biggest thing was is that we were, it's all building. Just bear with me. It's all building to why it could be a downfall. So we made all these bombing runs, right? How much time do we get? How much time do we have? Oh, it's up there. Um, take, take 10 minutes and then be back in your seats. I'm just going to talk to everybody. Um, I joined the Air Force eight years ago. Uh, actually grew up just outside of Scranton in a small town in Milford, Pennsylvania. Um, graduated high school, wasn't really sure what I wanted to do with my life. I thought I wanted to do, uh, be a firefighter. And uh, well, after 9-11, everybody wanted to be a firefighter, so um, it was a little tough. And I kept finding myself coming up short, whether it was with education, whether it was with uh, just not having work experience, uh, not having college or military. And after about four years, I kind of got tired of driving from town to town. Like I, I went to Mount Mountain, you know, Milford, Pennsylvania, which is just outside of Scranton. I drove to Scranton, I drove to Philadelphia, I drove to New York City, I drove to uh, Trenton, New Jersey, I drove to a couple other towns in New Jersey, Baltimore. I really wanted to be a firefighter took tests in all those cities. And every one of them, I've come pretty close, but just couldn't seem to, to make it. Um, when I finally uh, I saw an ad online for the uh, military, I saw a Navy ad. It was a firefighter ad. It kind of caught my attention. And I said, you know what? I, I put that on the back burner about going into the military. And I decided, why not? I'm still young enough, 22 years old, or about to be. And might as well give it a shot while I'm still young. What's the worst that can happen, right? I, I you know, do a couple of years and then get out or, or what have you. So I went and visited the uh, Army recruiter, the Navy recruiter, the Marine recruiter, and I was like, they just weren't answering the questions that I had. And I just happened to stumble across the uh, Air Force. Now my family has served in the Army, different, different different wars. Uh, since World War I, I can trace uh, a relative from my great-grandfather, served in uh, the Navy in World War I, and I had my grandfather and his brothers served in the various branches of the Marines, the Navy, and the Army in World War II, and so on. Uncles, great-uncles, Korea, Vietnam, you know, all the way up to Gulf War I. So I never thought of the Air Force, because nobody I knew served in the Air Force. 
so when I talked to the Air Force recruiter, she was, uh, she was really nice and she answered all my questions. And then she even uh, went as far as to say, what is it that, you know, anything I do in the military is what I make of it. So I was like, hmm. So I went in there like, you know, 22 year old hotshot. I want to be a firefighter. She was like, that is great. What other jobs do you want to do? <laughs> I was like, I don't know. And so I picked, a, I picked five jobs and I went on a waiting list. I was getting impatient because I, I really wanted to just be in the military and, I, uh, and just get this started. And I picked, uh, I called her up and I says, all right, it's been two months, what's going on? And she says, well, we're just not getting jobs right now. I was like, what jobs are you getting? And she's like, security forces. Have you ever heard of them? What you have them? They're just basically like cops and security for the air base. Um, she's like, we get a lot of slots of those. Like, sure, why not? Let's get this over with. So, boom, did it, signed it. She says, what do you want to do, four or six years? I'm like, let's do it right, six years, let's do this. <clears throat> Jumped in, I left for basic training November 20th, 2006. That date is ever ingrained into my brain. You know why? Because I met my best friend on Thanksgiving that, that year, and we were shining boots together. <laughs> he said, thought we'd never be doing this you know, after we just ate a turkey dinner. And we uh, had a great time. You know, obviously, uh, me and him still stay in touch. We went through basic training together, went through our technical training, which is still at Lackland Air Force Base. It's 13 weeks for, for COP. And when we came out the other side, we got different assignments on different sides of the country. And uh, we you know, kind of just did our careers. Now, when I hit my first base, you know, it was about April 2007, May 1st technically is my date. So I get to my first base and I'm a 22 year old hotshot. All right, let's do this, show me a patrol car. And they're like, we're not showing you a patrol car, we're showing you a gate. Like, what? No, I want to drive like bad boys, like cops, you know? Like, pull people over and stuff. Like, no, 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 you don't do that right away. You go over here and you check IDs. <sighs> okay, did that. Now that is just our proving ground. It's basically, let's see if you can actually handle the job that a trained monkey can do. If you can handle that job, then we can give you other jobs. But because some people can't. So, uh, which you come to find out in the military. There are people that really just cannot handle the simple responsibilities. So after I proved myself on the, the gate, I moved up to being a patrolman, and then I, moved, I went on my first deployment. Uh, I volunteered for it. I really wanted to go. I didn't want to you know, join the military and not actually go overseas. Uh, so I volunteered for the first, I went to my uh, deployment manager and I said, where's the first place to go? And I'm like, we don't know yet. I was like, well, put my name down. I want to go wherever, you're, wherever they're going. He sent me to UAE, United Arab Emirates, not even close to Afghanistan or Iraq. I mean, it's close, but I mean, the Middle East is close, but let's put it that way. Um, but I took it in stride. It was considered a deployed location. I worked my butt off. I trained really hard, and I joined an organization. When I got back to my to Dover, it's called the Ravens. Um, the reason why I tell you it all like that is because when I say I worked my butt off, I mean I ran 10 miles a day. I was doing push-ups close to 100, flutter kicks into the 400s. I was doing sit-ups close to about 100, and so on and so forth. I wanted to be a Raven, and here's why. The mission of a Raven is to fly in every type of environment, to go everywhere in the world, wherever our big birds go, our big cargo birds. And they go everywhere, and not to just where Air Force bases go. That's why we're there, because there isn't an Air Force base in every country, but we're needed in every country. So we go, I've gone to places, I've eaten breakfast at the Eiffel Tower. I didn't know there was a restaurant there. The most expensive restaurant you'll probably eat at. I had a croissant and a coffee, just to say I ate there and it cost me like 15 bucks. <laughs> so <laughs> that was just the, for the sake of saying I ate there. I went to the Louvre, <coughs> saw the Mona Lisa, and the Mona Lisa is about this big. Yes, and it's on a wall the size of this hanger. Yeah. That really makes it big, right? No. 
and it's in a very crowded room because everybody wants to see the Mona Lisa. And I get in there, I crowd my way in, I get to about as close as I'm standing to that wall. And I go, awesome. <laughs> that looks great. And then I turn around and there's this huge mural. I mean, I don't even know how the painting got into the room. This thing is huge. It's all framed down and it's on the wall. It's of the Last Supper. Huge. I mean, it is tall as this building. Huge. And I thought that was impressive. Just the sake of painting something that large and in that much detail was impressive to me, not that. <laughs> but, you know, to each his own. So I got to, you know, explore the Louvre. I got to go to the Eiffel Tower. I've gotten to walk in the streets of Jerusalem, which you don't have to be very religious to appreciate it. The, the history alone is very appreciative. Um, I've gotten to walk in Red Square, and if uh, you know anything about the Cold War, I mean, that's a huge deal for me. And I, was, I remember seeing, I mean, I know you guys don't, but I remember seeing the Berlin Wall come down and the fall of communism. And I remember seeing before that the marching in the Red Square and all the communist troops and all that stuff. But to stand there as an American and actually be welcomed there was impressive, was, was very impressive. I've gotten to go to St. Petersburg. Does anybody know where St. Petersburg is? It's in Russia, yes. Does anybody know what's famous in St. Petersburg? St. Catherine's Cathedral. The cathedral, that gold dome cathedral that you see in a lot of movies. It's like one of those features when they show Russia, they show that. But in my mind, if, if this is the landscape that they always show, I wanted to see it. Um, I also want, you know, I've, I've gone my last count, I was at 36 different countries that I visited and over five different continents. Yes, we do go to Australia. I just was unlucky and didn't get to go on the rotation that I was going there. Trust me, I was really mad that I didn't get to go. But I've gotten to go everywhere else. Um, the reason that, that all that travel happened in about two and a half years, a lot of flying but I enjoyed every minute of it. Um, I am married, and my wife was like, well, I, I appreciate that you like what you're doing, but I really would rather you be home a little bit more. When I took the job, I thought that I was gonna be home a little bit more, but I flew about 200 plus days of the year. <laughs> so not much time for a home life. And then I actually, so I uh, took a job as a investigator which was its own challenge. And it was very interesting because now when I watch cop shows, I really get mad when I hear them say, have the CSU guys sweep for prints. Because the detective and the CSU guys, that's me, all wrapped up into one. As a military investigator, you are a one-man shop of everything. You do everything from, from blood, DNA, uh, you can, you know, fingerprint, dusting for fingerprints, you can do, you know, evidence collection, uh, photographs, yes, you take your own photographs, that's awesome, because it's like you can't touch anything until you photograph it first. So you have to photograph everything, and then you can move stuff in the room, and then photograph it again, because obviously you've moved stuff in the room. So that's always fun. Yeah, when they actually find stuff at a crime scene, it makes me mad when they like reach down and grab something, and the pictures haven't been taken yet, because I'm like, what did you just do? <laughs> but, yeah, it's a TV show, I know. But. It was, it was interesting. I did that for three years. I enjoyed every minute of it. It presented its challenges. Um, I got to either, uh, I was either the primary or secondary on 120 different cases. Of those 120 different cases, I was the primary on 70 of them. And of those 70 cases, I solved 65. So in my mind, that was pretty impressive. Those five, I just had to wash them away because they were just unsolvable. It was my turn in the ro rotation, and I had to deal with it. Somebody took my dog. I'm sure nobody took your dog. But it was my, it was my uh, burden to bear. That's all. Um, after that, the uh, Air Force said that they needed recruiters. And I, and I was like, great. You should go find some. So they did. <laughs> you. And, I, and uh, when you re-enlist in any military branch, You've changed from just being there for six years to making it a career. Um, and that's why 
I will do whatever the Air Force asks me to do and the best of my abilities to do it. That's why I'm here talking to you guys. Not just about the Air Force, but I agreed to do this class because part of my job is to reach out to community service. I love doing community service. I love interacting with you guys. I love interacting with young minds because you guys are going to either replace me in the world or in the military someday. And I really hope that I'm that recruiter or that person that maybe made a difference in your life. That's why I love doing community service. I did it even when I still was being a cop. Uh, I like doing community service. So um, hopefully one day, you know, you guys will, you know, I know all of you have dreams and, and you're going to be pilots and you're going to go to college and you're going to do all these things. And I want you to follow your dreams until the end of the rainbow. But always have a plan. Please always have a plan. All right, don't just follow it on blind luck. If you're going to go to college, know what you're doing, how you're going to college, how are you paying for it, and don't take out student loans. It's not, it's not worth it. There are so many people, my sister included, uh, there are so many people that take out student loans, they're in so much crushing debt because of it. And I don't know who sells them on student loans because I guess they're just like, oh, you can pay it back later. When you get your diploma, you also get the bill. Okay? so. I always tell everybody, I'm like, I'm not, I'm never going to tell you that you should join the Air Force or any branch for that matter. I always say just have a plan and whatever you do. All right? If your guidance counselor is not going to talk to you, I will. All right? Because it's not free. Nothing is free in this world. College education is going to be handed to you. And everybody's like, well, I'll get a scholarship. Yeah. Scholarship isn't free. You're doing something for it, whether it's an academic scholarship or a, a football or some sort of sports scholarship or an instrument that you play. You have to play that instrument all the way through college. If you're an athlete, you have to be an athlete all the way through college. It's not free. They're, they're, that's how they're paying you to be an athlete. And the reason why I tell you this is because my sister, she wanted to be, a, she was going to play basketball, and that's how she was going to pay for school. Well, basketball was fun in high school. It was not so fun in college because you miss because every moment that you're not in class, you're out playing basketball because you have to be a starter in order to scholarship. Just things they don't tell you. And that's why I, I try to tell everybody, as young as they are, if you're going to be in the academy, great. Know what the academy is looking for. This organization right here, Civil Air Patrol, awesome. That is an awesome thing to have on your resume, especially if you're looking to go to the academy. Um, if you're looking to go into ROTC, again, this is another, or this is a great organization to show them that you're actually going to do this. I always urge you that if that's what you want to do, do it. But no, don't wait until your senior year. Don't wait until February to start planning to go to the academy if you're graduating in June. You've already missed the boat. The same thing with uh, the ROTC. I have people calling my office saying, we want to know about the ROTC. Great. I don't know anything about the ROTC. I'm not the ROTC rep. The ROTC rep is at the college that you apply to. Have you applied to any colleges? going to go to a college, if you're going to go to ROTC, know what ROTC, is that what college that you want to study? I'm just telling you all these things because, you know, not many people think about this. And guidance counselors, there are some great ones out there, but there are some not so good ones. Or they just don't know. Or they don't talk about it. So anything you want to do in life, don't let anybody tell you no. Or that you can't get the information. Know what's at stake. Know and that's in anything. Don't be afraid to make a mistake. In acting, not doing anything is worse than doing the wrong thing when it comes to your education. Okay? If you just sit back and wait until you graduate and then go, now what do I do? It's too late. You've made that mistake of waiting. If you wait until your senior year to say, all right, now I want to go to the academy. I hope you were doing something throughout those three years of high school that's going to get you on that academy. It's very competitive, and that's all branches. Okay, It's very competitive to get to the uh, Naval Academy in Annapolis and the uh, West Point for the Army Academy, as well as the Air Force Academy. I just urge every one of you, if you take anything away from anything I've said, is that whatever you plan to do, have a plan. Know what you have to do to get there. Know what the standard is. Don't just assume that just because you want to do it, that you get to do it. Cool? Awesome? Yay? Nay? Cool? 
Does anybody have any questions for me about my career life? Anybody have questions about their life? No, I'm just kidding. Okay. Uh, what was your favorite place that you visited? Uh, my favorite place? Oh, that's a toughie. Everybody asks me that. Um, I guess I would have to say... Uh, it was really a cross between, I would say Jerusalem was my favorite place. Uh, what was your least favorite? Oh, my least favorite, that's so easy. Uh, it would be Djibouti, Africa. Does anybody know where that is? <laughs> that is the, this teeny tiny country right above Somalia. It is the armpit of Africa. It, I don't know who decided to settle there. I really don't. I really think that whoever was there probably had sunstroke. They were like, this looks like a great place. Somebody should have shot him in the head. <laughs> because there is no, they can't plant anything there. They can't grow anything there. It is a desert, and yet there's somehow a town there. It's weird. And a country there. But. What's your favorite aircraft? Oh, my favorite aircraft. Oh, you got to give me a platform. What platform do I have to pick from? Rotary. Rotary. Plane? All right. If I, I'll break it down. If I have to pick a fighter plane, I think the F-35 is pretty, pretty cool. Everybody likes the F-22 because of its technological advances. I think it's a piece of crap because it really, it really is over. The technology they put into that is awesome. It's state of the art. But did you ever hear of too much technology? Because that's what that has. They took out the fly-by-wire. You know, everybody knows what fly-by-wire is, right? Yeah. There's no fly-by-wire in an F-22. So when you pull on a joystick. It's a computer telling it to, to do whatever it is that you told it to do. And it won't go exceed its payload. So that means like the pilot's instinct that I can go faster or harder is taken out of the equation. Less pilot error is what they say. But it was outmaneuvered by the F-18, which was built 30 years ago. So that's why I say I don't like it. I like the F-35 because it's back to the fly-by-wire, but it has a lot of good technology. Go ahead. Is there also a V-2 What's up? Isn't that also a V-2? What is? The F-35B. The F-35B? Yeah, well, the, the F-35, the, F the, the joint task fighter is what it's, it's called. And the reason why is because it can, it can adapt to any platform that, or any branch that needs it. It can land on the hangar deck. It can land on a runway. It can do a fighter mission. It can do a bombing run. It can do all these different things that are needed for different missions. Whereas, and that's what the F-22 could do, except with stealth. Like, oh, that's really cool. It's like, yeah, but it's, you know, like three times the price for one. Um, um, all right. First, uh, isn't, it, isn't it actually fly by wire because uh, that's how, like, uh, they also have, like, what is it then? Well, it's not fly by wire. Fly by wire is when you, when you pull on it, you're actually pulling on a whole bunch of relays of wire that pulls on the flaps that actually push the plane where oh, it goes. Okay. When you pull on an F-22's joystick, there's no wires that it's pulling against. It's a computer telling it what to do. So if you pull back, it's telling the computer, hey, I want to go back. And the computer goes, okay, we'll pull. It, it still has wires and stuff, but it's not the same. It's not directly attached to what the pilot is doing. You, you had your hand up. Yeah. No, you, I thought you had your hand up. No? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Fast and worst memory in the Air Force. All right. Best memory of the Air Force. Well, actually, I'll start with the worst. Worst memory of the Air Force. Um, happened in basic training. Okay. Um, my recruiter failed to tell me that I, he, she said whatever other recruiter tells their troops, and I refuse to tell any of my kids. Um, they say, don't volunteer for anything while you're in basic training. I was like, okay, cool. Don't volunteer for anything. Problem is, you can't hide in basic training. <laughs> there is 30 of you <laughs> under the thumb of a TI, and trust me, he doesn't miscount. Um, so when he hands out jobs, there's plenty of jobs to hand out. Everybody's going to get a job. What she should have said, and what I tell them, is figure out what job sounds interesting to you and do that job. So I didn't volunteer for anything. 
I wound up with three jobs. <laughs> so when I wound up with those three jobs, they consisted of uh, entry control monitor, which means that I had to pick for who was losing an hour of sleep that night to watch the door. Trust me, I was not the most popular person in the bank. <laughs> then I had to uh, be the, um, the TI's, he calls it the assistant. They have other names for it, which I won't share with you. Um, I basically was the only one allowed in the office to clean. I was the only one allowed in the office to do paperwork. I was the only one allowed in the office to do anything. So I also got in trouble for a lot of things too at the same time. And then the last job I had was called Chow Runner. Now here's what's great about Chow Runner. Chow Runner is basically you go in, you make sure there's enough room, you stand outside, and then you basically tell everybody that's standing out there one, one row at a time, they can go in and start getting their food. So if you're the chow runner that day, you, you're supposed to have an alternate. If you're a chow runner that day, you basically are eating last of your group, which kind of sucks, especially when you're on a buffet line. They run out of stuff. So, you know, as basic training goes on, not everybody that enters basic training graduates at the same time because they either get injured or maybe they, they quit or they get washed out. Well, my, the alternate chow runner, well, they got washed out. So they didn't approve, well, appoint a new one because we were only three weeks away from graduating. That's, that was their logic to it. My logic was, yeah, we're three weeks away. That means three weeks of meals that I have to hope that there's something left on the line. Um, so I, do you ever get a craving of food? Yeah, you like really want something? And if you don't get it, what happens? It doesn't go away, right? It just starts building and building and building. Well, we were walking past the chow hall one day and I smelled pancakes. And later that night I was like, man, I just, oh, I'm gonna tear into some pancakes tomorrow morning, I'm really hungry. And uh, my best friend, he was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was egging me on the whole time. So then, of course I'm chow runner and I get up there, no pancakes. <laughs> All right, tomorrow's another day. Get through the line again, no pancakes. So about a week goes by with no pancakes. And there's whispers from what I'm told. Like, Divine is going to kill somebody if he doesn't get his hands on some pancakes. So nobody touch any pancakes until he gets through the line, okay? And so I went through the line and there was pancakes. <laughs> Thank you. So I get through the line and I'm going to sit down. Now when you go through, the buffet line goes like so, like so, and then you come here, and then you turn and go to your table. Well, when you get here, there's a nice, lovely table they call the snake pit. And not because there's wild animals on it or anything, but there's a whole bunch of TIs that sit there and eat their breakfast lunch there. <laughs> and they have a little game called, let's see who we can stump. Because you have a whole bunch of memory questions that you have to know. So. I was like, cool. So I get to the end of the line, I hear, training divine. <laughs> training divine reports is ordered. What is this? What is that? What is this? And they asked me about 15 questions. I was there about five minutes. And I answered every one of them. So I was like, yes. You know, I was all excited. And he goes, and I have pancakes to boot, right? And then he goes, takes my tray, slides it to himself, and says, why don't you go get yourself a hot meal for, for being such a great <laughs> <laughs> Needless to say, there was no pancakes when I got back to the line. <sighs> that would be my worst memory, because when I got out of basic training, the first thing I wanted to do was go eat some pancakes. And on my first breakfast, like basically you have different times when you get out. Well, Saturday was the first morning we were allowed to meet with our families and go off base. And we went to IHOP which had all-you-can-eat pancakes. <laughs> I got about five stacks in before I went, <laughs> So that would be my worst, best one, best memory. Um, well, let's, let's split it into two, because there is a memory that is self-serving, and there's a memory that is, I guess you would say, selfless. Um, self-serving. I, my first Raven mission, I got to fly to Germany, to Yemen, to Africa, and back to Germany. And my buddy pointed out to me, he said, 
how great is this? We just stepped on three different continents in a single day. And I was like, wow. Yeah, I did. Because <laughs> we did. We got to we, we spend a little time on each one. And I thought that was the coolest thing in the world. And that was very self-serving for me. And, and then, of course, every place I visited was its own reward. As the, not so much the Djibouti Africa, but <laughs> the, the other, other places weren't so bad. I guess the, the one that would be selfless was I was an investigator, as I told you, and I was able to recover this, uh, this young person, he, uh, this young airman. He uh, didn't have, a, you know, you don't really have a lot of money, especially when you're starting out in anywhere, especially the military. And uh, he got, he had a roommate, two roommates, and they, uh, they all split rent and the whole thing, and his uh, balance was empty. Actually, it was in the negatives, and he's like, he came, filled out a statement, said, I don't know what happened, you know, this this isn't supposed to happen, we just got paid. Yeah, we all got paid, first and the 15th, right? Well, this was the second, and he was at negative balance. That should not be. So I uh, dug into his finances, and I was able to recover the money for him. He was so thankful because he actually was going to use the money to buy his pregnant girlfriend away. So it was kind of nice because I was able to make that you know, stress go away and be that that shoulder or that that, that person that I'm looking against. So in my mind, that was pretty selfless, but I liked it. It was a good memory. Cool. Anything else? What do you like to eat? Let's, let me ask you that one. Pancakes. Pancakes. <laughs> 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 Great, that's probably the best place. Now, where, where's, what's, what, what kind of food do you like? Um, I like seafood. You like seafood? Alright. Um, Japan is great for seafood. Um, the best seafood that I had was actually in Spain. In Rota, Spain. I actually had my first shark steak. It was delicious. And yes, and other seafood appetizers. Probably the best seafood I ever had. I've had it in Maryland too. And yeah, this is definitely better. Okay? Awesome. Alright, let's get back to this and I'll have you out of here right on time. Awesome. Alright, so just to sum up real quick what we went over before the break and the, the break on top of the break. Um, we talked, obviously, about historical battles. We also talked about the underlying themes. How do we learn lessons? Well, we learn it through knowing our history, knowing what happened, right? We know we learn it through knowing some type of ethics and rules because we, if we don't follow them, sometimes we stumble, right, and we fall. We also went through some of our some of the battles, how the Greeks and how the Spartans, how they used the how they use the Spartans used the exact same strategy over and over and over and over again until ultimately everybody knew how to beat them. Um, didn't matter how great they were, they just didn't change their strategy. Um, and how the Greeks overcame the Spart the Trojan yeah, the Trojans because they used the Trojan horse, right? Which um, basically changed warfare. It was a strategy never used before. And we moved into aviation, how we moved, how we had air balloons, hot air balloons, zeppelins, how we went through planes. Reconnaissance was the theme, right? On almost all of them, except for the zeppelin, which was bombing. And then we moved into World War II and how to gain air superiority. Why do you think air superiority is important in, in strategy? You can see a lot farther from in the air than you could on land or water. Okay. That's partially true. Is you lay up the well, um, This gets the infantry gets stuck up with something to call for support without any issues. Very true. The biggest thing... Go ahead. Do you have something to add to that? Uh, because you can like, have the most like, power in the air. Mm -hmm. So... 
that allows you to reach anywhere in the air? Yes. Yes, yes, and all yes. The air superiority is important because if we have a very dominant infantry, and I say like we're taking all this ground, you're going to cross in the open eventually, right? Guess who's going to pick you up? Who's flying around in the air, right? No? Somebody disagree with that statement? Yes? Yes, right? Because air superiority is important because whoever controls the air will eventually control the ground. I mean, yeah, you'll be able to move, but you won't be able to move as freely, right, or as fast, because you're always worried about who's coming around, right? You've got to worry about air patrols, not your air patrols. Yeah, it can really bog you down. Um, the, nice, the, the biggest thing, does anybody know what the biggest ground-to-air situation does anybody know what came about in World War II that wasn't used in previous wars? Uh, go ahead. Radar? What's up? Radar? Radar. Yes, that's, yes, but not what I was going for. Um, rockets? Rockets, okay. That's not really what I was going for. Anti-air guns? No, all, all good. The biggest thing that, that came about was the, the um, ground-to-air tactics. Basically, being able to call in air support when you need it. Never used it before. In World War One, there was no such thing as a radio to call up to the airplane and say, "Hey, can you shoot over there for me, please?" Here, there was a relay system. It wasn't the best, but it was the start. It was what laid the groundwork. Anybody else have anything you would like to add to that? Okay. Awesome. Korea. Well, obviously the words are up there again. I think something got lost when I emailed it to myself. But you can read up there what came about in Korea. The helicopter, right? U.S. emergency, emergency dominant air power. Yes. Very good. <laughs> um, the, the, uh, the bet, obviously, goodbye to the prop fighter plane. Right? We, 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 we stopped using the single engine prop or rotor uh, engine, and we started using the jet engine. It became dominant by the end of Korea. Uh, the other thing that, that happened at the end, that started in Korea, helicopter. Yes, it was invented before Korea. I got that. I know. I've read it too on Wiki. No, I'm just kidding. But <laughs> we all know that the helicopter was invented, but it wasn't used for the military until Korea. Does anybody know what? We used it for in Korea. Go ahead. Medical evac. Medical evac. Yes. And what did the Navy use it for? One of the sea cadets. Come on. <laughs> Search and rescue in the water. Basically, for man overboard or something in the water. Plane goes down. Helicopter go in. Try to see if they can help. Um, but yes, for the most part, it was medical evac. Um, it was, if anybody's watched the old TV show, MASH, that helicopter, that was the helicopter of Korea. Not much to say on it, except that it did introduce the fact that we can traverse terrain quickly, move in and out of battle without actually having to set up a runway or anything elaborate, or drive a jeep or something all the way there. It's pretty interesting. Um, the jet engine, you know why that was so important? During Korea? Man, it's always the same three. Somebody, you guys put your hands down. Somebody else. Somebody else. No, somebody else. Come on. Go ahead. You're really quiet. You got nothing? No. All right. Somebody. You got something? No? I don't bite. Right. Um, and a lot of supply a lot faster. Mm -hmm. Who is our. Who, what, does anybody know what plane, now this is definitely just a few ways, does anybody know what plane we were flying against? Go ahead. The MiG. The MiG. Does anybody know what, do you know what model? MiG-15. The MiG-15 was fast, and it was faster than what we were bringing to Korea when we started. Go ahead. Uh, I have a comment. Uh, it actually looks very similar to, like, America's um, F-86. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, the MiG and the uh, and America's planes started had some similar features, um, but similarities definitely 
change when you actually pilot it. The, the biggest thing that, the, the reason why it was important that we introduced the jet engine and was able to roll it out so quickly into our fighter jets was the fact that they were out maneuvering us. I mean, we were getting cranes in the sky and losing a lot of air battles where in World War II we were dominating Blue Bob and everybody else that came across. We were actually starting, we, were, we gained air superiority where we, we had to. And here it is in Korea where we came in right at the start of the fight and we were already outmatched by the NIGs. Um, once we introduced the, uh, the jet engine, our, our tactics, our skills, our strategy emerged as, as the new dominant air power. There was a couple of different things that happened in Korea. Does anybody know what branch of service actually served in Korea that didn't serve in any previous wars? I'll give you a hint, I'm wearing a uniform for the people that don't answer normally. Go ahead. Air Force. Air Force. Uh, so the, the Air Force and it was introduced into Korea. Um, funny part is, is you're going to learn in, in, in even in the next stage of it, they didn't know what to do with us. They didn't know what to do. They're like, awesome, we have an army. They still had the Army Air Force. They still had the Marines. They still had the Navy. They all had air power. But we flew the first jet engines into battle. We established, we established air dominance. Uh, I have a question. Uh, were these aircraft, like the jet engines, like the first ones, mm -hmm. were they called like second generation? Yes. Well, the first generation were our test, test fighters. They weren't actually the, the ones that actually made it out. So, as Korea came to a close, so came Vietnam. The reason why I picked, I mean, there are a lot of air campaigns. There are plenty of ground campaigns in Vietnam. And we can sit here and talk solely on Vietnam until you guys fall asleep at your desk. Operation Rolling Thunder, does anybody from their own reading, can they tell me just a brief overview? Put your hand down. Put your hand down. Can you, anybody tell me a brief overview of what Operation Rolling Thunder was? Somebody who doesn't answer normally. I will even give you the words to say to say it out loud. Go ahead. Basically, President Lyndon B. Johnson, the Secretary of Defense, they chose certain areas to bomb in North Korea. They first started lower at the section, and they started moving up because they were afraid to hit Chinese and Russian areas. So they pretty much just wanted to keep on bombing them, destroy their supply lines, railroads prevent their army from growing, and then that would end up boosting the morale of our fighters. Very true. All, all right. All perfect. Anybody know what the underlying tone that they were using with that? With the, why we were consistently bombing over and over and over again these targets? Can anybody take a guess? Go ahead. Um, to weaken their... Uh, yes, you're trying to weaken their position, right? What was it that, what was the message they were trying to send when they trying to tell you, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to say because I, I think we're never going to come to the same point. They were trying to say, we can bomb anywhere, at any time, any way we want. That's the message they were trying to roll. I mean, Operation Rolling Thunder ran three years, am I right? Three years. Three years of constant bombing of the North. It came to a point where they had an actual meeting in Washington once a month of when they were going to do it where they were going to do it, how many aircraft they were going to use, when they were going to approach, how, many or, how much ordnance they were going to drop. How ridiculous do you think that is when you have people in Washington making that decision? They were getting cocky. What happens, what was the one quote that I used that could really, really wrap this up? Anybody? No. If you don't change your tactics, Keep going. They're going to learn your whatever. Yeah. <laughs> you do not you change your tactics. Adapt your tactics because, trust me, your enemy will. And that's exactly what happened. They would set up dummy ammo sites. They would set up dummy railroad sites. They wouldn't even actually build the real railroad tracks back. They would just make it look good. Just so that there would be something for us to bomb. They knew that we were coming. Every week they knew that we were coming. They knew that we were going to bomb all over the place, 
but they had no, obviously they had no way of saying what we were going to bomb, so they just started putting out places for us to bomb. And we, we fell for it, hook, line, and sinker. Um, who here wants to take the side of success? Who thinks that Operation Warren Thunder was a success? Anybody? Who here thinks it was a failure? Is anybody raising their hand saying it was a failure because I said it second, or do you really truly feel it was a failure? Okay. All right. Cool. So everybody thinks it was a failure. All right. Well, that's the side I was originally on. I was really hoping you guys would be on the success side. Uh, <laughs> just, can anybody give me somebody who doesn't normally answer? Can anybody give me a reason why they feel it was a failure? Somebody else. You've been answering. Go ahead. The U.S. got more losses than North Vietnam did. Very true. And how? In, in what way did we lose? What was our losses? We lost more money, more planes, more people. Mm -hmm. More money, more planes, more people. Yeah. Money going into ordinance, fuel. I mean, we just ran ourselves dry because it, it costs a lot of money to, to send up a, a sortie every week, a bombing run one anyway. At that, not to mention how many times that you know it's not every time they came, they went, flew, bomb, dropped up a couple bombs on targets and came back. Sometimes they came back. Sometimes a couple planes got shot down. There was no. Ta it wasn't like a safe run. No real safe run, so yeah. Eventually, they just ran out of ran out of patience. So in, in essence, it was a it was a failure because I put the map up here, and I actually found this one because I liked it. Do you know where we were flying out of for Operation Rolling Thunder? Can anybody pick where the no? Good. Lions. No. Close. Was it Saigon? No. We were flying out of Thailand. It was the Air Force base in Thailand. It's actually the second division, now the seventh Air Force. Flying out of Thailand, bombing its targets in North Korea, in North Vietnam, and then flying back. Problem was, is that the seventh Air Force had to call the 13th when it needed fuel. Who thought that was a great idea? Your basically their command structure was set up that anything tactical or operational had to go through the 7th Air Force, or at the time, the 2nd Division. Anything logistical, meaning fuel, manpower, things like that, supplies, had to go through the 13th Air Force. Yeah. Who here thinks that's a great idea? Nobody? Right. Who here thinks it's a bad idea? It's a bad idea. The reason why you never split your command structure, lesson learned, is in World War II, this is why those who do not study their history, you can repeat it. In World War II, and even in Korea, we found that we had a broken joint structure because we could never appoint a supreme commander. In World War II, we actually capitalized on that when we actually appointed Eisenhower to be the supreme commander of all allied operations. It was almost perfect, and everybody worked in unison and in the with each other. Um, in Korea, fell away from that because we had a UN general, but the Navy didn't listen to the UN appointed general and so on and so forth. And that's why we started having those messed up campaigns. Vietnam, it got even worse when Washington decided they were going to play their hand in the military. Game. And they decided that they were
Go ahead. <laughs> no? Go ahead. It allowed us to transport men to different areas. Perfect. What, does anybody know what unit that was? That did it? Huey? Yeah. Yes, Huey helicopters. Does anybody know the Army unit? Do we need the branch of service? The Army unit that they were, what they were called? Air Cap. Air Cavalry. Have you ever seen the movie We Were Soldiers? pretty good example of it. You actually want to see it. Um, but that was a huge difference. We actually, that was something we did right and that we could take away from Vietnam, is that we actually knew the terrain we were getting in. We couldn't bring traditional tanks and jeeps and everything like that through it. So we adapted to using air, air superiority. That's where we emerged from and we said, oh, we can do this whole thing from the air. Not really but it was in the right direction. Um, as far as casualty listings, it all changes, but if you're ever interested, U.S. casualties were 50,000 total casualties. Between Vietnam and Russian and Chinese troops, they were in the, um, close to a million casualties. We lost because we lost the ground, but if you look at the numbers, all right, post Vietnam. No, 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 no. That wasn't supposed to happen. All right. There it is. Just do that for now. All right. Not in any particular order. But the next major operation, I mean, you could say Grenada, you could say any of these other small things, but the biggest thing that we did next was Operation Desert Shield, later Desert Storm. Do you know what the difference was? Somebody else can answer all of them. Okay. If I remember correctly, Desert Shield was uh, they're taking back, but it was more like to push invading forces out, not a total invasion. I believe Operation Desert Shield was since Iraq invaded Kuwait, we were there to defend them, and then Desert Storm was to uh, overthrow Saddam Hussein. Yes. Um, it wasn't Kuwait, though, that we were at. When Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, we took position in Saudi Arabia. That was so that he could not advance any further from Kuwait. The desert sh Storm was the take, was the liberation of Kuwait and in the overthrow of the Saudi or the attempt at overthrow of Saudi Arabia. Biggest thing that came out of that was the coordination of air and ground power. <coughs> when we when we got the green light for Operation Desert Storm, what do you think happened first? Anybody? Want to take a stab at this? Go ahead. Bombing. Bombing. Yes. And the bombing run, it wasn't called that at the time, it later took on this name, it was shock and awe. Literally bombing every target that they can get their hands on within a few miles of the border. That means radar towers, everything, jamming towers, even uh, communications, supply lines, heavy uh, troop defense. I mean, we literally bombed them into almost submission before our troops hit the ground. That's how it worked. Shock and awe was something that was, was given the name to it, but the actual method of bombing first and then rolling your troops in really came out came out on top. And that method is still used to this day in different aspects. We don't do it the exact same way. Why don't we do it the exact same way? Because if you never change your tactics, the enemy is gonna learn how to do it. Um, Next major operation was Operation Desert Fox. Does anybody know what that was? It was really small. And when I say small, I mean by days. We bombed a whole bunch of different, like, what we suspected was training camps, weapons depots in Iraq. It was uh, an answer for different terrorist acts all around the world um, at the time. It was in 1998, if I'm not mistaken. Anybody doesn't, nobody really remembers that. 
Look it up. Operation Desert Fox. Okay. What was that one? Uh, I forget what it was called, but it was some missions where they started dropping MOABs on forget, Iraqi or Iran. Dropping what? MOABs. MOABs? Cover of all bombs. Yeah. The, the you know. daisy cutter kind of Yeah, they... When they dropped, when they dropped the, uh, when they dropped bombs like that, it was basically for those are for infantry dense areas because we, we try not to bomb when you do daisy cutters like that or when you actually do the, the moai. When you do stuff like that, you're you're really just bombing everything. It's like a big carpet that you're laying out. Um, the only time we do that is when we know it's a heavy uh, troops troop movements. Okay. Okay. But yes, we did start using those during Operation Desert Storm. Was actually um, Operation Noble Eagle. Go ahead, what were you going to say? Um, it was uh, started after 9 11. Yes. Well, yeah, Operation Noble Eagle. And um, it was like a joint thing with the uh, uh, U.S. Air Force and the Royal, Royal Canadian Air Force. For Operation Noble Eagle. Well, yes. And Here's what people don't, uh, here's what we forget. Operation Noble Eagle was uh, War on Terror. That was the operation given to the entire umbrella of the War on Terror. The main operations that, uh, that we would remember from that, Operation Enduring Freedom, Operation Iraqi Freedom. There was Operation Anaconda in there, which was basically <coughs> to strangle supply lines. Um, there was Operation... Um, African Horn. Does anybody know what that was? And don't say it just happened in Africa. I get that. Anybody give me what that was? Yeah, that has something to do with Libya. It had to do with the uh, Somali pirates. What happened to do um, What we were getting, when the pirates, when the Somali pirates really started becoming a problem, attacking shipping lines and stuff off the coast of Somalia, we decided to take action because that was our shipping routes as well. Um, it kind of fell under the terrorism. The reason why I brought up only these two out of them is because of the significant air superiority and the changing of tactics. When we first uh, took Iraq, we really didn't change what we did when we attacked them in Desert Storm. We did pretty much the same ground plan with one minor difference. We weren't stopping in a couple of weeks. This was going to be until we got to the end and liberated Iraq. The Operation Enduring Freedom was given to Afghanistan. That, everybody, unfortunately, it was over the main strict parts of it were over in a couple of months. The actual longevity of it didn't end until 2012 when we finally announced uh, mission accomplished and started pulling our combat arm out. It became New Dawn, which was Iraq's main new sorry, not North With Iraq, dwindling down and Afghanistan ramping up, we changed our tactics significantly because we moved from just moving, we were moving convoy, heavy trucks, heavy equipment, in country. We changed our tactics over the course of the years because what happened? We brought in Humvees. Terrorists knew how to bomb them. Humvees. We brought in low-line uh, surveillance planes. They got smart missiles and so on and so forth. And we kept changing and changing and changing until we had one of the biggest airlift missions since World War II because then we started airlifting everything. I was uniquely a part of that in 2012 when we actually airlifted everything in every part of the country. We took off and landed in almost in bits of runway that I didn't even know existed on what, what it looked like a highway. We would land, drop off supplies, and go. Uh, it was a very unique mission. It actually took uh, it took us about two years to to get all the fobs and everything established where they were. They the idea changed because we were controlling the richest parts of the country, but terrorists don't need the richest parts of the country to move. They just need land. So this idea was that we can move into these more remote parts of the country and still be able to engage the enemy and strangle off what little ground he had to move. The reason why I felt it was big it was a big deal to a lesson learned from this 
is that we kept changing our tactics throughout the war. I mean, the war went on, has gone on since 2002, is the official start date. And here we are 13 years later, and it's coming to a close. In that time, we have changed our tactics multiple times. I've been in the, in the Air Force eight years, and in those eight years, I, every time I've gone on deployment, we've changed our tactics. We don't do the exact same thing I did in 2008 when I deployed. We changed it again in 2010. We changed it again in 2012. Constantly changing our tactics. And it's the smartest thing we ever did. And it's all because lessons learned. We learn our lessons and we adapt. And we overcome. We adapt. We overcome. We keep doing that over and over again. And the reason why it's important that you understand that is because not everything that you do in life is going to be sunshine and rainbows. You're going to have those times where you're going to hit that brick wall and you're going to have to just figure out how to adapt. And you don't necessarily have to go through it. You just got to figure out how to get around it. And questions. Anybody got anything? Are we going to like move on ISIS right now? Is there any like military strategy against that? Um, Yes, uh, the ISIS threat is basically, what's happening right now is we withdrew a lot of our forces from Afghanistan and Iraq. Iraq, if you know, is part of where ISIS is. It's expensive to go to war. It's a lot of money because you can't just go. Um, since our drawdown of forces, it's taking a lot, it's gonna take a lot of funds to get us back into that region, hence why we didn't want to leave in the first place. Um, to answer your question directly, Jordan has taken up the fight right now with ISIS directly. We are supporting them in every capability that we can with satellite and intel that we can supply. Um, as far as actually marching troops into Syria and Iraq, that's being debated right now on the Senate floor. Hopefully they make a decision soon because um, sidebar on the whole thing, we can't stick our heads in the sand and hope this problem will go away. That's my opinion. Everybody has their own, but here's why. ISIS is not an enemy 300,000 miles away. They are literally using social media to get to us here. They've already recruited people out of the US, and now instead of trying to get them to come to join the fight where ISIS is, they're asking them to start taking attacks out on us here at home. It's a scary thought, but that is why we're so proactive in the world, because we don't want that to happen where our citizens are being targeted as, for propaganda. Um, it's a huge deal and it's something that you know everybody has to deal with but we're we're dealing with ISIS right now using our civilian uh, branch uh, FBI, CIA and, and things like that. We're trying to stay co co uh, covert and trying to let the region take care of the, uh, the heavy bombing. Uh, but pretty interesting, yesterday or the day before, Jordan bombed, did its first bombing run and killed 55 militants, including one commander. So pretty, pretty good for, for Jordan, I have to say. Yeah, I heard they were like, they were like so mad after what like uh, ISIS did to the Jordan. I was like, I heard um, the king of like, Jordan himself wanted and like took a sword and said, <laughs> Interesting about the king is that, believe it or not, um, everybody thinks like royalty, you know, they just get it. Um, he did. Don't get me wrong. He did. Um, his, he has a very interesting uh, history, if you didn't read it yourself. He actually uh, was a military officer for his entire life. He only ascended to the throne after his father died. Um, but he was a major general, not the general. You know, everybody knows how the ranks go, right? You know, brigadier general, major general, lieutenant general, and then general. He wasn't a general, he was only a major general. He worked, he refused to just be handed rank. He worked his way, I mean, he went through different flight schools, different uh, training, he was a commando in his forces. That's huge, and he is that kind of king. Like, he, he really wishes he was a little bit younger so he can actually take the fight down. to read a little bit about it, but uh, does anybody have any questions about the lecture and not ISIS?
That's an awesome question. Why is it only now that you talk? <laughs> that was a great question. Um, Operation Rolling Thunder, its successes. Okay, if we would have had a more uh, grasp on our demand structure instead of letting it be, remember I said the split command? We would have had a, command, a, a grasp on our command structure and we actually were bombing targets, not a long three year just bombing random targets. We were actually using the bombings to, to coincide with ground forces. That was a big disconnect. They were just bombing for the sake of bombing supply lines and trying to deliver that message. Hey, we can reach you anytime we want. If we weren't doing that, and we actually used our ordnance, our supplies, our resources to actually maneuver and gain ground, yes, I think Operation Only Coming would have been a success. But the fact that they were just bombing for the sake of bombing, I think it was a, a huge failure and a waste of money. Um, that's my opinion. Just I don't, I know you're all going to be mad right now, but uh, this is not on any exam. This is just a, a free class. You know. Hope you all enjoyed it. Uh, I, I really uh, look for uh, you know feedback to your instructors if, if you really uh, would like me to do this in a different way or another class or anything like that. Um, if you ever, I, I'm usually at the uh, 801. Every now and again, I, I plan to come out to the 805, and I would love to come out to the uh, classes online on YouTube. Search JCAEA or Joint Net Aerospace Education Academy. You should find them. You have to have a 90% or more test average to pass. I think you need to have a 75% but to get honor cadet we want you to get a lot higher than that so 90% and a 90% quiz average because there is a difference between the tests and quizzes. You have to meet promotion requirements or equivalents promote if possible. I don't know about the sea cadets but at least civil air patrol cadets can certainly promote at least once in this time with the classes. Participate in color guard or other special activities set up by your units. You'll have to speak with people at your squadrons about opportunities that are available for you. Attend a Joint Cadet Aerospace Education Academy special activity because we're trying to set at least one up. Uh, you're going to have to complete your simulator hours you're going to have to complete your homework assignments correctly and on time. Now I know as we're beginning there's a little bit of confusion as to what's going on and all that, but soon I hope that we'll have this all settled out and we'll all know what to do. And use correct spelling and grammar on the written assignments because that is something I've been noticing a lot. I've been seeing a lot of run-on sentences a lot of fragments, a lot of contractions missing the apostrophe, a lot of things which should be capitalized and they're not capitalized. Now, I don't care if you do little things like if you end a sentence with a preposition, I could honestly care less. But if you don't make the first letter in your sentence capital, that just shows me that you aren't going to take enough time to do your work well. So just have reasonably good grammar. And also, when you are replying to someone else's paragraphs online, uh, I don't want to see any more of the sentence that say, I agree. The words, I agree, do not count as a full sentence. It will not count in your three sentence per paragraph count. I mean, you can put it there, but you have to have at least three other sentences in that paragraph. Because I agree, what does that tell us? It tells us nothing. It just says you agree with it. If you said I agree because, then it would be great, but just I agree will not count as a full sentence. You'll wear your uniform properly to all classes. Look in the uniform manuals to figure out what to do. 
I want to see things reasonably ironed, boots reasonably shined, hair reasonably done. I don't care if everything is fit and polished and perfect, especially not with the field uniform. But I want people to put a little bit of effort into it. So attend your unit meetings. I'm going to get in contact with the connect commanders, possibly the senior member commanders as well, in order to ensure that this is done. So if you want honor cadet, you will have to attend unit meetings. No discipline issues. I haven't seen any so far. Everybody's been very well behaved, and I certainly hope that will continue. You will complete an essay, 500 to 1,000 words, typed, correct spelling and grammar, on one of the following topics. How aerospace has affected my life, including at least three specific examples. How aerospace has affected amusement parks, including at least three specific examples. How I, as a cadet, can educate students from pre-K to grade 12 or some subset of those ages in aerospace. How the leadership information that you're learning as cadets will help you get interested in aerospace, and see the Civil Air Patrol and see cadets. You would to get Honor Cadet, you would also write a paragraph and submit it to the Academy's Cadet Public Affairs Officer, who would be, or which would be suitable for publication in an article promoting the Academy, because hopefully we can do this again if this turns out well, and we could really use some help with public affairs. You would you do all that stuff, you would have to do that stuff to get Honor Cadet. Some bonus things which would help you win out over other people who have done those things. If you have never been to encampment or some sea cadet equivalent, register for it. If you have been to encampment, register for Hawk Mountain Ranger School or volunteer to staff Hawk Mountain Ranger School or again, a sea cadet equivalent. Now, obviously those things don't happen during the academy, so you just have to submit your application, yes? Man, what if we already had both? You can do, you can go back for the more advanced courses with Hawk or you could go as support staff because they can really use a lot of support staff because they have about five cadets for over a, for almost 200 cadets in the school, so support staff help is really appreciated. So those are basically what you should do to get it. The, obviously, to get cadet of distinction, you'll need all these requirements. Everybody who completes the, these will have something like cadet of distinction. Honor Cadet will be the person who completes the most requirements and does the best. And if everybody, if a lot of people do this, then we'll choose them based on some other criteria. Just this is a good guideline. Thing. I don't know what next homework assignment is. Yeah. Okay, so the previous homework assignment was to do research on Operation Rolling Thunder. The next one is to go over chapters four, five, and six and write the three paragraphs, three sentences each about those and respond to two people's paragraphs. For those of you who do not have computer access at your homes or at least have, cannot access the forums, just write those on paper, write those three paragraphs on paper and then to the, or once you come here, just try to come here a little bit early so that you can access a printed out version of at least some of the paragraphs so you can respond to those on paper. Does anybody have any questions? Yes? Um, what was the YouTube I don't know what the channel's called, but I found... It's just diverse. called Joint Cadets Air Aerospace Education Academy. Like, it's it's listed on uh, right there in the paper. Uh, all you have to do is look it up. It's super simple. We're the only, we're the only one, so... We're pretty special like that. Yeah, I, I searched on the video and one video came up, so it's pretty easy to find. Any other questions? All right. Remember to sign out when you leave. Uniform for next week will be BDUs and MWUs. And before everyone goes, uh, first, uh, with the quiz, did anyone spot the typo on it? Yes? Uh, you wrote J E A C A. Oh. Yes, the E and C are reversed, up right up top. So, I was wondering how long, if anyone would break that out. But does anyone have any questions on any of the questions? Quickly? Yeah. 